Hey there, and welcome to Reveal Truth. Prepare yourselves for another mind-boggling story. Grab a drink and let's begin. Can I ask you what you are doing sir? Said the man to my left, just outside of my car window. Yes, you can, I answered. Ask away. That's not quite what I meant. The voice said. I want to know what you are doing. Of course I'd noticed and was fully aware the man asking was wearing a city police officer's uniform. I was not so drunk I could not recognize that fact. I was, by this point feeling a pretty good buzz. The reason for my flippant response was that right now, I simply did not give a duck about much of anything, especially stupid questions no matter who was asking. I'm sitting here enjoying watching the moonlight reflect off the lake while sipping on my single barrel select whiskey. It is a calming sight. I answered. Now I do not like being pretentious, but I happen to enjoy the flavor of this particular whiskey. I spend the extra money to buy this stuff, and I intend to enjoy it. And if I may add, it is a little better than the blended variety offered. At least this time. And something about moonlight is kin to calming. Sir, are you drunk? The voice asked. Almost, I answered. I hope to be there before long. In fact, I hope to kill some brain cells tonight. I'd like to obliterate a few million of the suckers that tell me I love the witch I am married to. I'd at least like to get to the point I can handle getting rid of her without too much remorse. Okay, we can get to that in a minute. The voice said. Do you realize that operating a motor vehicle while intoxicated is a crime? Yes, sir, I do. I answered. But I'd like to point out I am not operating a motor vehicle. I am merely sitting in one drinking and getting intoxicated. This vehicle has been rigged to not operate or at least move if the driver is inebriated. The driver has to enter a 4 digit pin number plus blow into this device. I pointed out the straw above the ignition switch. Any alcohol content above 3 quarters of the legal limit renders the vehicle inoperable. I am certainly incapable of operating this vehicle. The voice pointed out the interior light was on as was the radio or at least the sound system. Yep, that all works. I said. I want to see well enough to not spill when I pour my whiskey. I could listen to music if I wanted right now, I just want a little background noise. It's cool enough to not need the AC. I'd also like to point out that while the engine may turn on automatically occasionally to recharge the battery, the car cannot be put into gear and driven. I added. So, would you care to explain why you are sitting out here in a city park, drinking? The voice offered. I looked at him closely. Well, sir, I offered. I needed a place to sit and collect my thoughts. Home is just not conducive to that endeavor at the present time. I wondered how he'd react to my changed manner of speech. You do not need to call me sir. Officer will suffice, or you can call me by my name Gary. He said. May I see your driver's license? I handed it to him and he passed it to his partner. I'm sure he had already run the license plate number so he knew I owned it. Maybe he was just checking who was using the car. I almost laughed. I could understand some of the politically correct bullshit society was throwing at us, the cops offering their first names in a non-violent encounter. This guy seemed unflappable. Well, instead of calling you off his sir, three syllables, I figured to cut that short and call you sir. I said. He looked at me closely and then grinned. You're that drunk are you? He asked. He could tell I was just being a bit of a smart ass. Oh, I'm every bit that drunk. I answered. I'm just not that stupid and can maintain. At least for now. I really don't give a sheet if I get too drunk to cope. I was aware of the cop's partner stepping back up to return my license. They obviously had no intention to leave, but had not ordered me to step out of the car either. I wondered about that. They stood there hunched over while they observed me, looking uncomfortable. Both refused my offers for a drink or to sit in my car where they could relax. Their sergeant arrived and conferred with them. I guess later on they had quickly established my identity when the first officer came back, walked around the car and sat down in the passenger seat. How about we talk a bit, Mr. Jacobs? I like the young man. I told him the last Mr. Jacobs I knew was my father. My name was John. He smiled and nodded. Then he asked if I had somebody he needed to call. I shook my head and said not unless it was illegal for me to continue my drinking, and then he could call my lawyer. Drinking alcohol is legal in the park until 2 a.m., he said. Then I'll sit here until then or I'm ready to leave, and I'll either call an Uber or my daughter to come get me. I'll need to talk to her anyway. By the way, why did you decide to sit with me? I got special permission. I'm not sure why. My sergeant told me to sit with you and talk. He offered. Why? What do you know about me? I asked. Not much. This began as a simple man drinking in a car in the park call. Once we identified you, my directive was to sit and engage so here I am. I really have no idea what that means. 
My sergeant said have a single drink if I think the situation warrants. He'll sign off on it. That alone gets me thinking there is far more to the story. But I'm still not going to have a beer nor any of that whiskey. Do you have any soda or water? The young cop said. This is single barrel whiskey. It is almost sacrilege to dilute it. I exclaimed with a grin. But there might be a soda you'd like in the cooler behind your seat. I like something caffeinated every now and then, so I keep some stocked. He reached back to open the built-in refrigerator unit. What kind of car is this? It looks like a regular little hybrid from the outside. But everything in it is high-tech. This is no ordinary car. He asked. Who are you? I ignored the young cop's obvious confusion and changed the subject by asking, are you married? He shook his head. Well, I wouldn't be for much longer. Have you ever thought about marriage, or rather the sanctity of marriage? Fidelity versus infidelity. Well, yeah. Gary offered, hesitantly. I'd expect my wife to not screw around, and I sure as hell would not. I had a girlfriend that thought since we weren't married, she could still have sex with whoever she wanted. We aren't together anymore, not once I caught her screwing a guy in our apartment. I asked him what he did. I almost did enough to get kicked off the force. I pushed my service weapon into his balls from behind, and offered to blow them to kingdom come. He was screwing her from behind when I got home. If I'd known they were recording their screwing, I still might have punched him in the balls, but I'd never have pulled my weapon. I laughed and offered my fist for a bump. He grinned back. Of course he begged and cried and almost sheet himself, and then later tried to file a complaint. He was taken aside and told he'd have a hard time if he pursued anything, and he might not even be able to walk down the street without having to show ID every block or two. And if he spit on the sidewalk he'd be arrested. He got the message and left town. I still got a letter of reprimand, of course. That was a total gift, and only because a senior officer had been in a similar situation a few months before, and they covered for him. Well, that is a better story than I have. I confess. I'd have loved to caught the bastard while he was ducking my wife. I might have pulled that trigger though. I'd certainly have nailed his balls. Even if the bastard is half again as big as me and a dozen years younger. Gary looked at me. Okay, I take it your wife is cheating, and you know who it is. I nodded. The kid was perceptive. You didn't catch them in the act. I shook my head. My wife Donna gave me the dumb line, we need to talk. She didn't even preface it by saying honey. I got no more respect than Rodney Dangerfield. I said. I got home from a long day at work, and there was my wife and sister-in-law waiting with a couple small suitcases packed. I walked in the door and got ambushed. Damn. Gary exclaimed. What happened? I get told I am a worthless bustard. I said as I took a sip of my whiskey. Well, not in those exact words. What the wife says is she found somebody more exciting, more in tune with her needs than I have been. Doris, her sister, is sitting there smirking at me, listening. I ask her what she is talking about, and she says she found a real man, one that puts her needs above his own, and makes her feel like a real woman. I said. Her sister is nodding like one of those little bobblehead dogs you used to see in the back window of the car. Then the witch, the sister-in-law I mean, says, he has plenty of money to support her in the way she deserves. So no arguing about it and no talk of divorce. You better get on board and let her have her fun without any bullshit. She went on to tell me the guy was man enough to handle both of them sexually and rock their boats. So apparently both women are slots for this guy. Now that hurt. Not the she was cheating part. I hadn't even fully processed that part. It was that I did not fill her needs and make her feel like a woman. Strangely, that was my first thought. Plus I could not or did not support her. I have to admit I was confused with it all. Donna never complained about our sex life before, so I know I am adequate in that department, and I treat her well, but the supporter lifestyle part was plainly wrong. You think I altered this car to keep myself from getting a DUI? I built this thing because my brother-in-law was a chronic drunk, and I was trying to protect his ass. Do my part as a member of the extended family. He'd have to enter the pin and blow into the analyzer before he could drive home after drinking. I always suspected the reason he drank so much was probably because of his witch of a wife. He was a nice guy and stayed with her because of his kids, even if they were mainly grown. The idiot could not get the car to run one night, and accepted a ride from one of his drunk friends, and both got killed. I took the car back. Let's get back to your wife, Mr. Jacobs. The young cop said, patiently. I told him to call me John. Okay John. So tell me about the rest of your encounter with your wife. I grinned. You are recording this, aren't you? I still can't figure why you are sitting here with me. Do you have a degree in psychology or something? Is this one of those new age, woke interventions? I asked, as I took a sip. Not that I care. I'm gonna sit here and drink until you arrest me or I need to pee. Oh, I get it. 
You wait until I step out and arrest me for either public intoxication or urinating in public. Gary shook his head. Nope, neither of those things are more than a minor ticket. One of my bosses made the decision I was to sit here with you, and that is what I intend to do. My degree was in engineering. I went to school under an ROTC program and served my four in the army after college. After I was discharged, I needed a job, and the police force was hiring. So two years in, here I am. Engineering, huh? I said. Well, maybe later I'll show you how this car is set up. You might enjoy the tour. Anyway, back to my story. The wife, Donna, tells me I am a worthless sheet. Not her exact words, but the same meaning. Her sister is agreeing. They picked up their little cases and walked out the door laughing. My wife said she'd be home Sunday afternoon or evening and we would discuss it. Fat chance I'll be there for that. I muttered. I have a daughter who just graduated college who I need to call. I'm a little afraid to, though. She's at that vulnerable age. Trying to start a career and maybe a social life while living on her own for the first time. How do I tell her that her mother is a cheating slut? Worse. What if she knew already and was afraid to tell me? Even worse than that, what if she knew and condoned my wife's cheating? I couldn't take that betrayal. I began to shake. I almost lost it. Hey, guy. Gary said abruptly to break me out of it. I mean John, I'm Mr. Jacobs. He paused to regroup. Let's approach this one step at a time. You have not talked to your daughter, correct? I nodded and then shook my head, confused about which way to answer. Tell me about her. Gary said. I relax a bit. I love my daughter. She came along only a year after the wife and I had been married. We got married while both of us were still in college. The wife said no more kids so that was it, one kid no matter what I wanted. I know what you were thinking, but yes, my daughter is mine. She even resembles me, or rather other females on my side of the family. She is not as ugly as me, thank God. Gary laughed along, which made me feel better. She is smart as a whip and decided to study computers instead of engineering, even though she has the aptitude. Maybe you ought to call her now. Gary suggested. I balked and shook my head. He shrugged, but I could tell he was not going to let that go. Later. Maybe. I conceded, not happy about the idea. I don't want to leave my car here and I'll need a ride when I do. I need to figure that out. I'm just not ready to go. That is part of what I've been thinking about. I'm making plans about how I want to go forward. If you keep drinking that whiskey you aren't going to remember any of those plans anyway. Gary offered. Sure I will. I said. I have a voice operated recorder going. I've been making notes. Sorry, I should have let with that to tell you our conversation is recorded automatically. I just assumed your body cam was on. I expect to have anything I say recorded. So do you know who your wife is seeing? Gary asked. I nodded my head. About that time he received a call on his radio. He stepped away from my car. After a few moments he returned. Mr. Jacobs, what is your job with Essink Robotics? He asked. I shrugged and told him I was an engineer. Gary smiled, more than that, a very senior engineer, right? I nodded. This just got more involved than sit and engage. My captain said you were the man who developed some of their cutting edge prosthetics. He was just on the line. He said you were responsible for his daughter walking again. You developed a prototype for limb function. They help existing limbs to function normally. That answers the question of why I am sitting here talking to you, he asked me personally for an update. I shrugged. He obviously has an interest in you. Please sir, I'm Mr. Jacobs. Don't duck this up for me. I could tell he was supposed to keep part of what he'd said to himself. I wondered how Eddie knew I'd been contacted by his officers. I suspected he'd flagged my name that he'd be notified immediately about anything that concerned me. That was not exactly legal in my mind, but it was nice he was looking out for me. I'd know Eddie since junior high. His teenage daughter had been injured in a boating accident two years before and lost the use of her right leg. He was happy to let me use his daughter as a test subject for one of my prototypes, and now his daughter was on her feet and walking. Eddie and I had stayed close so I was happy to help. I'd like to take you home sir, Gary said. I refused adamantly. How about I take you to a hotel? You sleep off your drunk and then approach the day tomorrow with a fresh perspective. Seriously? You expect me to look at the world tomorrow with anything better than I do today? I snapped. No. I said a fresh perspective. That means a clear head. Gary explained. Make decisions rationally and not clouded by alcohol. I said I liked the alcohol and was not ready to go anywhere yet. He shrugged. He tried to distract me a bit by asking about the prosthetics I was developing. I told him that was only one of our divisions. We had several projects ongoing. We were also working on features to enable self-driving cars. 
I could see him visibly interested in some of the technical aspects. He asked about some of the other projects that were developing. We started a line of voice-operated robotics to enhance the lives of paraplegics. You know, give them a little autonomy in their daily lives. Voice-controlled motorized wheelchairs for instance. Some of our devices would do more. We were even working on robotic arms that would pick up things and even help the user eat. We were working on one that would wipe the guy's ass. We had a little setback there when one of our testers got all excited and shouted. Will slap my ass and duck me raw. I paused to see how closely Gary was listening. He stared at me for a second and burst out laughing. I could tell he also had a sense of humor like mine. Tell me why you wanted to be cop. I asked. You seem to have the technical aptitude and the right credentials. Why didn't you apply to SC Robotics? I did. They weren't hiring. I got a letter saying they'd keep my resume on file. Gary said. I knew that was a brush off and my resume wound up in the round file. And I needed a decent paying job locally. My mom needed financial help and my sister is in college. It is what it is. I was not drunk enough to overlook this kid's potential. Send me your resume to me directly and come over to visit me in a few days. I have a few obvious personal issues to work out first, but I'll see what I can do. That is if you're still interested in that type of career. He stuttered a thank you then took a deep breath and got back to the task at hand. He was not going to let himself get sidetracked nor possibly bribed. How did you find out the name of the guy your wife is seeing? He asked. I followed my wife and your sister to the married. Nobody pays attention to a little hybrid sedan like this. I watched them as they met the guy in the lobby. That was all it took. The guy embraced and kissed both my soon-to-be ex-wife and my sister-in-law. Gary looked at me suspiciously. He did not state the obvious that I had to know the individual so I did. Yep, I know the scumbag. Smarmy asshole. I'm curious if he deliberately set out to cuckold me or if he is just playing games, but he is certainly not the well-heeled rich guy who can provide my wife a better life she thinks he is. I'm guessing you make a pretty decent living, Mr. Jacobs, ah uh, John, Gary said. I mean if you are a senior engineer after all. Well, I assume you are fairly senior, judging from your age and the way you talk about the work. I wonder why your wife would think she needs more money. Or is it just something she said to bother you? Ah, you curious if Don is just a horny witch out looking for a big clock, or if she is a money-grubbing witch thinking about trading up? I said. Probably a little of both. We have, or rather had, a fairly active sex life. Couple times a week. I'm only 45 and not slowing down in that department too much. At least it is what I think. My wife might argue the point. But she seemed to be happy with sex a couple times or more a week. I make sure she enjoys it. Either of us would start things and we seem compatible. I think she's just getting antsy and talking to her which of a sister has probably put ideas in her head. My sister-in-law is one of those compulsive individuals. She'll go gambling and be ahead a few hundred bucks. You know, hit a little jackpot. Next thing you know she has lost it all back and heading to the ATM for more money. She say she hit once so it is bound to happen again. By the end of the night, she's she face drunk and broke. She has a decent job that should be enough to live on, but she is always broke and barely able to pay her bills, even though her kids are grown and out of the house. My wife seems to bail her out constantly, which has been a bone of contention. I think she slips her sister so many often. In fact I am sure of it. I generally try to keep quiet about it. After my brother-in-law died, Doris started seeing different men. I stayed out of that discussion, too. I think the money is a bigger part of the issue with my wife. I don't bring home enough for her. She works as a school administrator so we have a double income. We live well, have a modest but very nice home, and I paid for my daughter's college education so she could avoid student loans. We go out to eat at least once a week to a nice restaurant. We travel a couple of times a year, and she gets to buy the occasional piece of jewelry, especially when we go on cruises. But she wants more. Fancier cars, even though ours are only a couple years old. She got pissed when I bought this car back from my sister-in-law in return for one of our bailouts. She said a simple hybrid is beneath our station, even though this vehicle has been adapted to be far from simple. She drives a small sporty coupe but once more. She claims I should go in and demand a raise. I know I could get one, but she'd just spend the extra or give it to her sister, and we'd be right back where we are. I did not add my brother had a nicer house or at least bigger one than mine, but also had more kids. I told Donna years ago we did not need a bigger house with more useless unfilled bedrooms. She never budged on the no more kids front. I don't want to be an ask, but it seems like your wife might be unhappy you aren't pushing for a raise. She seems to think you should demand it even if you think your lifestyle is good. She thinks all you have to do is ask and you refuse. Gary offered. 
Well, part of that is my brother is my boss. I said. Gary looked at me in confusion. Yeah, Bob is the CEO and general manager. Thing is we draw the same income, which my wife also knows. She just thinks we are both selling ourselves short. I did not want to reveal the rest of the story. Not then and not to a man I did not know well who had heard more about my private life than he should. Bob and I not only worked for Essing, we owned it, or rather our trust owned the controlling interest. We set our income level to be comfortable but not excessive. My older brother Bob was also trained as an engineer, but liked the business side and got an MBA, so when he graduated, he started a small firm building computerized control units for various electronics. We'd use money from our inheritance which was all locked away in a trust. The trust had paid for both our college educations. Of course Bob hired me even before I'd graduated. The company had paid me while I went back to school for an advanced degree. I'd been married at the time with a baby, so my wife welcomed the money. We just never bothered to let it be known how the company's infrastructure was formulated. Our families just assumed we held senior positions because we had been with the company since its inception. We hired special talent to make it run although for years now, our human resources hired most of the workers. The trust protected the company, but our individual assets were all subject to community property laws. That was part of what I was thinking about when Gary and his partner had tapped on my window earlier. So your wife thinks you are too soft to get with your brother, and demand to be paid what you are worth. Gary surmised. I nodded. He did not come out and say to ask, but I could tell he wondered if I was a wimp. Maybe I was in my wife's eyes. But I was happy with my job and my current lifestyle. We could live even better if she did not squander our money on her sister. So have you made any decisions so far? He asked. I told him only that I would be getting a divorce. I was not about to accept the disrespect. 24 years of marriage be damned. I think you need to have a talk with your daughter. You may be afraid of her reaction, but you need to hear it. He offered. I nodded reluctantly. Then he suggested he drive me home and when I cringed he said. Well, your wife is not going to be there. But I can see where you might be reluctant to stay there. You know, be seen as the rejected husband waiting for his wife to come home. I raised my middle finger. He shrugged as he smiled knowing he was getting a reaction. Were it me, I'd be packing up my wife's sheet and trying to establish my territory. But if your situation turns out like one of my fellow officers, your wife is gonna just move right back in. I'd at least get some of my personal stuff secured. Change the combination on the safe if you have one. Grab up important paperwork. Just no driving around tonight. I've been thinking about that. I admitted. I just didn't want to take the risk of getting angry and start smashing up the place. Or maybe burn the place down. I fantasized about that part. The house is paid for, and I don't think it is a crime if I don't file for insurance. Gary shook his head. Getting drunk and staying in a hotel is certainly cheaper than letting your anger get ahead of common sense and lashing out. You probably would not be arrested for arson, but your wife could still sue you for destroying her stuff, even if she doesn't actually file charges for vandalism. Plus she owns half of all of it. Not worth the risk. He stopped to frown. Even finding my girlfriend cheating on me was not reason for me to kick her out. Not according to the law. Because she was living there already and it was considered her home, she got to stay. We have some stupid ass clause about evicting people. I asked him how he handled it. Oh she got to stay in the apartment, but that didn't mean I had to stay with her. So I moved all my stuff out and I mean all my stuff. The furniture was mine, so when I got finished all that was left was her clothes hanging in the closet, and what had been in the dresser was left folded neatly on the floor. Her toiletries were still in the bathroom and her computer and all her books and stuff were on the floor. I left the food in the fridge because she bought some of it, but not a cupboard dish to eat it off of or a pot to cook it in. My buddies helped so they were all witnesses to nothing being destroyed or messed up in any way. I had to laugh. It was at a cry when I thought about how that part of my life was over. My marriage was toast. I was simply not going to let Donna treat me that way. When Gary once again suggested I call my daughter, I agreed. First I had him drive me to a drugstore to buy a toothbrush and then to a hotel. I stipulated it not be the married. Once I checked and I called my daughter. Gary called one of his fellow officers to pick him up, and after we exchanged phone numbers, he left. Daddy, why are you in a hotel? My daughter, June asked immediately. Did something happen between you and mom? I told her I would prefer to talk to her in person if she was available. Hell yeah, I'm available. I went out to dinner with my friends, but I'm always available for you. I'll be there as soon as I can. After I hung up I realized I'd forgot to tell her not to call her mother before we talked, but then decided I did not care if she did. What's going on? June asked as soon as I opened the door to my hotel room. She frowned at my half inebriated state. 
You being drunk means mom did something. I'm guessing whatever she did was both stupid and hurtful. She isn't stupid enough to try to kick you out. You'd have dug your heels in. She left you didn't she? She's off with Aunt Doris. I asked her how she gathered that. I drove by the house but did not stop. Aunt Doris's car is in the driveway but over to one side in front of your part of the garage. I could not tell if mom's car was there. June said. Oh, she. Did they go off together to party or, or worse? June asked the last part stepping close to see my reaction. I nodded. Damn. She exclaimed and grabbed me in a hug and squeezed me as she cried. I'm so sorry daddy. I could not hold it back and began to sob. Despite my anger and the feeling of hurt my wife had left me, I knew my little girl was on my side. I loved her, but I can't put up with this. 24 years down the drain. I lamented. Not down the drain. Just a new beginning, daddy. You have me. June proclaimed as we hugged. I was happy she did not immediately protest and say I needed to forgive. Finally I had to ask. Did you know any of this? Any advanced warning? She shook her head and then hesitated before continuing. Well, I suspected something was up. She and Aunt Doris have been spending a lot of time together. Surely you noticed that. June offered. I agreed. She even stayed over at her sister's house overnight on occasion. The light bulb came on. June continued, well, Doris has been doing a lot of partying. And by that I mean going out to bars, dancing and whatnot. She didn't say it outright, but I'm sure she has been sleeping around. She'd see some guy and comment on his butt being cute. That kind of thing. Mom said she sort of wished she could do that. Then she quickly adds something like, but I'm married. And the time she complained that you could make more money. All you had to do was go ask for a raise. June blushed. I don't like to say it this way, but mom said several times. If your dad would grow some bigger balls he could go demand to be paid what he is worth. He can't even stand up to his own brother for Christ's sake. I shrugged and said we had enough money to live well if Donna would not waste it. Oh I know. I've watched her waste money. Especially after you would not let me. You gave me an allowance the whole the time I was in school. I mean even after paying all my bills. You told me to consider that my pay for being a student and getting good grades. I had to live within that amount or do without. I think you deliberately limited how much I got so I had to learn to budget. June said. She broke off talking as she looked in the minibar. I can't drink that rocket straight. I need to mix it. Do you want to pay the high cost of this minibar, or do I walk down and use the soda machine down the hall? I need a drink while you tell me what happened. The thought made me laugh. Even now she was looking at the economical way. She was my daughter. For one thing this is not rocket. It is high dollar single barrel whiskey. It cost me over 50 bucks a bottle. But save the walk. We'll spend the money. Half of it is coming out of your mother's share anyway when we settle our property. That statement set June back. So this is not something you are willing to forget and forgive. More than an argument about money. June said. I told her it was much more and laid it all out. I gave her a detailed account of my time from when I came home to her showing up, including what I observed her mother and aunt do in the lobby of the Marriott. The cop sat with you in your car and then drove you here. She asked, impressed. I nodded. He's a nice guy. I said. Smart. He'll be successful at whatever he does. He gave me some advice. Like not go home and burn the place to the ground or throw all your mother's crap out on the front lawn for the neighbors to see. Although I am not about to hide a bit of any of this from anybody. She made her decision. I made mine. As far as I am concerned, I'll let everybody know what a cheating witch she is. She might even like the advertisement she's on the menu and available. She might be deluded enough to think she can trade up like she said. Or maybe she is trying to push some agenda to get me to accept her new decision to do what she wants. By that I mean she has to know she cannot share the same guy with her sister. Not in the long run. That whole idea is just stupid. It was her spouting off. You sat and thought all this out while sitting in your car and drinking. June asked, slightly amused. I'm not as stupid as everybody thinks. I said. I can think through a situation. Your mother did not just suddenly get hit by some impulse to be a slut. She and your aunt have been planning this. This has to have been brewing for some time. Ju nodded as she listened. What bothered me earlier was how much she might have told you. And if you on board. That got a reaction. June stared at me, her mouth open. That turned to a glare and then softened dot tears formed. You can't believe I would be part of any plan to screw you over, daddy. I shook my head. I knew for sure she had no inkling of her mother's intentions. I just had all kinds of thoughts tonight as I sat drinking. How came about, what really happened, who knew? I said. My thoughts were all over the map. Well, I can tell you this. June declared. 
She might be my mother, but that is not going to stop me from telling her what a dumb witch I think she is. She asked me what I plan to do now in the short term. I told her what Gary had said about how he handled his girlfriend's cheating. He is not an expert, but I have to applaud how he handled the situation. I said. He was decisive and handled it directly but kept his cool. I hope to be his cool. But I can tell you this, there is no way back. I'm just not wired to forgive this. This is not some one-time drunk mistake that can be smoothed over with counseling. This was a deliberate decision to destroy me. To rub my nose in it. Your mother might try to tell me it was just sex even. Or she was just trying to get my attention. Well, she messed up as she did. June said. You were always tough on me. Not that I couldn't get a lot of stuff out of you. But I could tell when I pushed the line. Your lower lip got this little quiver when you got mad. And you kinda pulled your shoulders back when your decision was final. I knew then it was game over. I guess this is not the time to discuss you helping me convince Uncle Bob to give me a job at Essink. June asked with a grin. I knew she'd been applying around and had a few offers, but all of them were out state. Now I gotta stay close to home to support you. I laughed but felt immensely better about things. I wanted her to be her own person and do what was best for her, so I never pushed her to work for Bob and me. Of course I'd love to have her come to work for the family business. Now was not the time for the big reveal. We'll work that out, honey. Was all I said. June and I sat and talked for a few hours. She was too drunk to drive after a few drinks, so we sent down to the lobby for a complimentary toothbrush. She slept in the other queen's size bed. I heard her get up a couple times to go to the bathroom. I woke to sounds of the shower running. June emerged fully dressed, her hair damp. I gotta go home to change clothes, and I'm going to the house. You take a shower, check out and meet me there. We need to get started on handling things. She ordered. No breakfast, first, boss. I asked. She grinned at my sarcasm and sternly told me to get my butt up, showered and home to change as well, and then we'd talk about breakfast. I really did not want to go home by myself. I figured I might just change my mind and dump some of Donna's crap into the front yard as a public statement and let her move it back on her own. I took my time and two hours later I drove up to my house to find June's car parked in the driveway. A pickup truck I'd never seen before sat in the street. I walked inside to find June drinking coffee with Gary, the officer from the night before. You told me how Gary, uh, Officer Jensen was helpful. So I copied his phone number down and gave him a call this morning. June offered his explanation. This won't get you into trouble. I asked the young man. He shrugged and told me he was off duty and this was his day off. He was pretty sure his captain would be on board, and if not, he was thinking about a career change anyway. I went to change clothes. Gary, can I get that car that is blocking my access to my garage towed away? I asked. He grinned and told me it was my house, so I called a tow company and had the car removed. The person who left it blocking my garage would have to pay for the tow and 40 bucks a day in pound fee when it was claimed. June had called a local storage firm that offered inside climate controlled storage to reserve a place. It was not long before most of my clothing and all of the personal possessions I did not want to risk were safely locked away. I even took a bundle of bedding, towels and the guest room bed and dresser, along with my recliner and the big screen television. I took the everyday dishes, but left Anna her good china. I made a point to clean out the liquor cabinet. Petty but I was not going to leave any of it. We still had time to spare. Daddy, you need to you authorize a few things I did for you. Like moving half your money. I use my savings account. You can do all that online you know so I just acted as you. I called your investment broker this morning to tell him you are in the process of a messy divorce and asked if you needed to go in person or if he could lock up your account. He said it happened all the time and he could do that. Locking it up is easy. To unlock it takes both you and mom together or a court order. Is that okay? I nodded. She grinned. Good because that's what I did. I also cancelled your credit cards. I reported them stolen, but I paid off the balance first from your bank account before I did. All your details were on your desk. I know you know better than to leave your book of pins and passwords laying around. I asked what I was going to do for money. Well, I left enough money for you to make an ATM withdrawal for cash for 400. Plus remember the credit card you gave me for emergencies only while I was in school. Well, you can use it. You and I are on that account. Damn. You are on top of things. Do you have it in for your mother? Gary asked. I thought the man was going to be burned too crisp with the look June shot him. No. My mom screwed my dad over so she could go slut around. If the situation was reversed and my dad had been the one to go off the reservation, I'd have done the same sort of things to help my mom. I'm trying to be fair. I'm just going to prevent her from screwing him over when she thinks about it. 
I have no doubt mom will be trying to pull cash out. I know my aunt. She will be egging my mom on. And once they realize dad is not going to bend over for them, they will act hard. Before we left the house my phone rang. It was Donna. Why the hell is my credit card not working? She demanded to know. They said it was reported stolen. You asshole. You are butthurt I found a real man, and your little boy ego can't take it. Well, I am standing in front of an ATM machine, and I will be hitting everyone I can on my way to the bank to get every nickel I can before they close. You aren't going to stop me from having a good time this weekend. I knew she could only get about 2000. The rest June had transferred. She had enough money to get by for a few weeks so she didn't waste it all partying tonight. I was willing to bet she'd be the one paying for everyone's good time. You made your decision Donna. I made mine. I said quietly. I am separating our lives every way I can until I talk to a lawyer Monday morning. We are finished. I hung up before she could reply. June and Gary had heard the conversation. I'm hungry. Let's go get something to eat. I knew I could not find an apartment and did not care to stay in a hotel the rest of the weekend. I called my brother and asked if he could put me up for the weekend. What the duck did you do? Bob asked. I told him nothing at all. Don't tell me Donna went all brain dead and left your sorry ass or kicked you out for no reason. I told him it was worse than that. Well, the guest room is made up. Bring your butt over here unless you need me to come get you. By the way, I hope you grabbed up all the bottles of that single barrel whiskey. Don't leave any around for Donna to pour out. I told him every bottle was secured or counted for. I've already processed one through my liver and kidneys. Well, don't waste any more of it before you get here. I want you sober enough to explain what happened before you get sheet faced. I told him I was taking June out to eat and would be over in a few hours. June was grinning. She looked at Gary who looked dumbfounded. Oh my uncle and dad break each other's balls all the time. I mention her language. I'm a big girl, daddy. I use worse. Anyway Gary, Uncle Bob and Daddy have each other's backs. Their banter means nothing. You can tell it is serious when the banter ends. I'll bet their next conversation is straight up. After we ate, they followed me to my brother's house and then went on their way. My brother and I had a series of long talks for most of the rest of the weekend. His wife Evelyn listened to a few at the beginning, and after muttering a few comments like conceited, self-serving bitch, she left us alone. I wondered when I'd hear from Donna X. She had not called me when she checked her bank balance. About 5 o'clock on Sunday, my phone rang. Hello Donna. I said in as level a voice as I could muster. What the hell have you done? She almost yelled. Where the hell is Doris's car? I thought you were just pissed and cancelled the credit cards trying to stop me having a good time. You mean that piece of crap car that was blocking access to my garage? I asked. I had it towed. I'm not sure how late they stay open on a Sunday, but their business card is on the kitchen table. You'll have to pay the towing and in pound fee to get it back though. I hope you saved enough of your party money for that. Is your little male ego so bruised you had to take it out on my sister? Donna gritted. I heard Doris yelling in the background calling me all kind of names. I told you we'd talk when I got home and I'd tell you how things are gonna be. You are gonna pay for your little temper tantrum. You know it will be our money that gets the car back not hers. First of all, you comment about my little male ego just cost you. I hate that. I said seething. Secondly I have no interest in hearing you dictate how things are gonna be. You made it clear you were going out to slut around, and you found a better man, so as far as I am concerned, he can have you. Did you seriously think I'd stick around to listen to you dictate how things would be? If you look around, I cleared a lot of my personal stuff out of the house. I told you yesterday I was separating my life from yours. I'll just take my little bruised ego and leave you to it. So if you have something productive to offer, say it or hang up. I heard her mutter, this is not how it was supposed to go. In the background I could hear Doris say, tell the wind to fuck off. He'll come crawling back before long. I hung up. Surprisingly, I was not upset. I felt cold inside, totally frosty. I realized I might mourn the death of my marriage later, but right now I did not really care. But I certainly wanted to get some payback. I halfway expected her to call me back to curse at me after she looked around the house, but did not hear another word from either Donna or Doris until late the next day. I'd taken the day off to talk to our corporate attorney who quickly directed me to a divorce lawyer. I was given the usually unhappy news of what happens in a divorce. I'd lose half of everything. Fortunately for me, my trust protected my business interests. Donna made about the same income as I did so alimony was not going to be an issue. We had a little in personal investments but only about 20,000. We pretty much spent our extra income sending June to school and bailing Doris out of her financial messes. Our main asset was our house which I'd be happy to sell or let Donna buy me out, which I knew she could not without a big loan. 
We had no dependent children. Doris did not count as a dependent. I made plans to have Donna serve the following afternoon. I honestly thought I would not hear a peep out of Donna until after she was served, and then it would be vindictive screaming. About 4 in the afternoon, she called me, I'd like to talk. She offered quietly. So talk, I told her. Not now. I'm still at work. Can you come home and we can talk in private? She said. Nope. I answered succinctly. You can close your office door and talk now or call me back after you leave. But as far as my driving all the way to the house for two minutes or less of discussion, it is not worth the effort. What do you mean two minutes? That is all our marriage is worth to you. She asked, perplexed and starting to get angry. No, it is worth far more than that. I answered. The time for a serious discussion was really before you started sledding around. I heard her take a deep breath, but I cut her off. But I am still willing to talk. I'd like to hear what you have to say. But I know your sister is going to show up and start running her mouth, and I will walk out the door. Or she will get stupid and try to block my car in. That will result on one of two things. When I have it towed again. Or, I break her window to get access and release her emergency brake, so I can push it out of the way. That will get me arrested. She said she makes sure her sister did not show up. The other thing that will shorten our discussion is you start saying things I have no interest in hearing. As soon as you do, I will leave. So no, it is not worth the cost of gasoline, nor my time to drive home. Same thing goes for a restaurant or some public place. You call me back when you are in a position to talk. I hung up. I did not have to wait, but 15 minutes for her to call me back. I'd watched my phone. We had our phones linked by a Find Your Phone app, so I knew she was still in her office. I wondered if she'd spent the past minutes thinking about her approach or if she'd been conferring with her sister. I didn't care one way or the other. Hello. I can talk now. She announced when I answered. Okay a few ground rules. I said. Her surprise ground rules had me grin. Yeah, first I don't want you to waste my time with explanations of how this guy you cheated on me with is so much more exciting than me. That will just piss me off. He might have a bigger cock and I don't really care. You never complained before nor did you suggest something more adventurous to try. Although I'm not sure what that might be. We used to experiment with various things. Don't tell me he paid you compliments and told you how beautiful you are. I did that. Besides, of course he would butter you up. That's what guys do when they want in your pants. I heard another gasp or perhaps a sigh that told me she'd indeed intended to say that. I also don't you to start to tell me this was only sex, and it is me you really love. Another sigh. We've used toys together, and I know you use them in private and of course I was never jealous of them. So don't think to tell me this guy was no more than a dildo. There was a human attached. This time I heard a whimper. I suspected I was busting every one of her arguments before she made them. And I certainly do not want to hear you threaten that if I don't fall in line with your new world order. Your new stud will take care of you in the manner in which you deserve. That was Doris's dumbest line before you left. If your boy toy was so rich, why did you have to use your credit cards the other morning or go to an ATM machine for money? Just because the asshole could afford a room at the Marriott and drives a Corvette does not mean he is rich. I cringed. I doubted myself and revealed I knew too much. I wondered if she caught on. She had. How did you know he drives a vet? She asked. And the Mary. I cut her off by saying, and last but certainly not least, don't tell me this was your first and only time cheating. The way he greeted both you and your sister told me he knew both of you well. This was certainly not your first time with him. I don't care if this was your second or your hundredth time. But both of you fucked him before. You followed us. She cried. I'm sure you did not hire a private investigator. You had no clue before Friday evening. We were so careful. I almost laughed. She totally forgot about the asshole's car. I did not want the getting back to him. Not yet. So, hearing all those rules of what I do not want to hear, what do you have say? She began to cry. I let her wail and sip my beer. Yes, I was coldly sitting, drinking a beer while my marriage disintegrated. We have 24 years together. Donna cried. Isn't that worth saving? I tried very hard not to laugh. It was not a happy or amused laugh at all. It was one of incredulity. You apparently didn't think it was worth thinking about that when you started cheating. Another gasp. I interrupted her. Tell me, did the asshole know you were married? I asked. She whimpered, I think so. Well, I'm pretty sure. Well, yes, he had to, from things he said. He gave me advice. What kind of advice? I asked. He told me if you got upset, to tell you how much a divorce would cost you. You'd lose half of everything you own and even have to pay me alimony. Donna said. This asshole was playing the power card. I thought. 
He said you would not want anybody to know you were cuckold, that no man wants that known. He said I'd be in charge and I could do what I want if I played my cards right. Doris told me the same thing. She believes him. She said some of the other women she knows got their husbands to fall in line. They might have shaky marriages but no divorce because it would cost too much. So he knew we were married and didn't care. You certainly knew we are married and from the sound of it, you don't give a fat rat's ass either. I said. Now, I'm gonna ask you this, and then you decide if you really have anything to add. What do you really think we are gonna accomplish right now talking? She began to cry. I want us to stay together. To stay married. You really can't get over your fragile fucking male ego, can you? She wailed. Without a word, I hung up. I mentally kicked myself for reacting so quickly. I wanted to know one more thing. Did the asshole target me? Did he know who I was or was he just after a little easy pussy? Orville Wendell Fontenot III, or Trey as he was known around the company, sauntered into Bob's office just after lunch the following day, Tuesday. Yes, Mr. Jacobs, you wanted to see me. He asked, casually. He was surprised to see me sitting to one side, but did not unduly react. He apparently did not realize who I was. I'm sure he knew my identity, but did not connect me to the bitch he'd been screwing all weekend. Trey Fontenot was one of our liaisons and had been with the company for about a year. What some companies called a public opinion official. He was a salesman of sorts. His job was to make us look good with the press and smooth over any problems with our clients. Not quite a salesman, he interacted with our clients on a frequent basis. His job was easy. We had few if any problems with our public image. His boss dealt mainly with press releases about our developments and arranged showings, and the occasional tour through our facilities. Fontenot's main job was to promote our image. He might coordinate with our clients on occasion so everybody was on the same sheet of music, publicity-wise. I considered it a total waste of effort and money. To my way of thinking, we only needed to stand on our own merits. Now Bob agreed. At least he agreed that continuing to pay Fontenot a salary was a waste of money. Tell me. You were out of the office Friday. Bob said. What did you do? And how did you spend the weekend? Trey looked a little confused. I, I spent Friday with a man from Global Medical, Larry Atwell. He came over from New Orleans. We coordinated our activities on our publicity. And the rest of the weekend I was in the company of a couple ladies. Trey stammered. Can I ask why you were asking? Yeah, I heard you were at the Marriott where you entertained them. I assume Atwell was still with you. I hope it was not on the company dime, and these women were not prostitutes. Bob stated. No sir. We did meet up with the women for a good time, but it was Friday evening after our meeting. Those women were not paid. Bob asked him what kind of good time, well sir, it is not really any of your business as it does not concern the company, but I'll tell you it is a little hobby of mine to seduce willing women and have sex. I take them out, wine and dine them, and then entice them into my bed for a bit of fun. These were two women I knew. It is all totally consensual. How did this come to your intention? Bob shook his head. Suffice it to say it has. I want to hear the story. Sit down. Trey began to grin as he relaxed. He apparently thought he was not in trouble and was actually a little proud of his conquests. Well, I'm single now. I got divorced two years ago because I like to play the field. I enjoy seducing women. I meet them, buy them a few drinks, dance a bit and if I can, get them to join me in bed. I'm pretty good at it. And it is fun. Nobody gets hurt. The bastard was 32 and good looking. I always thought he was a smarmy bastard. He seemed to carry a permanent smirk on his face. Nobody. Bob asked. How many of the ladies you meet are married? Don't they care about their marriages? Trey's grin broadened. Oh you have that backwards. Most of the women I go after are married. They make the best targets. It reduces the risk of permanent involvement. We just provide a little entertainment for each other. They are of two types. One type wants a little bit of strange cock on the side, a dirty little secret bit of fun they can hide from their husband. It makes them feel alive. Sexy, and maybe a little naughty. Some of them are real sluts and want to let their hair down and go wild. They'll do things for me they say they never do for their husbands or haven't since they were dating. I'll fuck their asses. Get them to shave their pussies and tell their husbands they did it for them. Some will get their husband to lick their pussies after I cumin them. Many will record that on her phone to show me later just for the extra kick. We both get off on it. Well, the Hubie doesn't know of course. He just thinks he is getting to fuck his wife who came home from partying all hot and bothered. The second type is a little more involved but super fun to work. They are the wives looking to upgrade. Hubby can't get them off so they need a better lover. Some want to trade up financially and are actually looking to leave their husband for a new guy with more money. 
I drive that red Corvette for a reason. That thing is a pussy magnet. I even have a few different personas. I used to be Lance Sutherland. There is a retail lumber store up in Shreveport of that name. I tell women I am down here to buy lumber to be processed for my company to sell. Bob asked him if women really fall for that line. Trey laughed. Most don't even question it. At the bars I am known as Lance, no last name. But I use credit card in that name in case I am addressed that way in a hotel or restaurant. I pay the cards off and the women are none the wiser. Lately, I've been Lance Parker, oil executive. I made up fake documents and leave them on the table in the hotel room. I let the women see them and think they look important before I scoop them up with my laptop and put them in a briefcase before we party. The women fuck and suck while their asshole hubbies sit at home and jerk off waiting for them to come home. A few of the women even think I am gonna take them away to a better life if their husbands throw them out. I'm guessing even if the husbands find out, most of the husbands forgive their wives after a while. At least I haven't had any husbands come after me. I have a third set of wives who want to get their cuck hubbies to toe the line. You know, go long and obey the wife or get half his shit taken away. I give those wives all kinds of advice on what to do. They let the cuck know they are messing around and dare him to make waves. Funny thing is the law and the courts are on the wife's side. The husband gets raked over the coals, and the wife gets the cream. Like the old Jerry Reed song, she got the gold mine and I got the shaft. Bob asked him how he meets the women. I hang out at a couple clubs where women go to be picked up. It is easy. I am known as a nice guy who can afford a room at the Marriott and not just a quick romp in the back seat. Or a blowjob and fondle out behind the club. I have a bit of a reputation. I try to be a class act. Some of the women actually introduce me to others. The woman from this weekend is one example. They are sisters, really pretty. They are a little over 40 and both totally hot. I met and screwed one, and she introduced me to her sister. I've done them both a few times, so when Larry came to town, I invited them to join us at the Mary for a weekend of hot, no holds board sex. They jumped at it. Women love to get lanced. His smirk turned into a white grin. How can you afford the Marriott every weekend? Bob asked. That has to be expensive. That's the beauty of the plan. Trey offered, grinning, almost excited to tell the story. My cousin is the night manager. He'll block me a room early and then after midnight, he'll change it back in the computer to say it was unoccupied. I don't pay a nickel. The cleaning staff show up, see the room needs to be made up so they clean it. Nobody is any the wiser. This weekend I got a suite, two bedrooms in the living area, all for free. The woman thought I am a high roller or rich. Larry and I both screwed both the sluts in every hole, and they loved it. My cousin even came up after he got off shift, and they double teamed him as his tip. Trey said. He did not see me ball my hands into fists. I so wanted to stand up and punch him in the throat, and then cut his balls off. They did all that and you didn't have to pay them. Bob asked, seemingly enthralled. Did you use drugs or alcohol or are they just sluts? No drugs at all. Well, no illegal drugs. Both Larry and I used Viagra to keep our cocks up and hard. But even then after a while, you get tired and have to rest. No other drugs at all, I can take a drug test at any time. I've given women a little X in the past, but it isn't worth the risk, and these women were wild. The only thing they would not do was girl on girl. Both said they couldn't do anything with her sister. And you can bet Larry and I tried hard to convince them otherwise. That would be kinky. At least Donna and Doris have a few morals. I thought. Well, I have a couple concerns about this, interesting as it is. Bob said. First, have you ever pursued any of the women here at NSYNC? No sir. Trey said. My daddy taught me early in life to never shit where I eat. I know we have hard non-fraternization rules. Okay, so you do this picking up women here in town. Do you do anything of the sort when you go out of town? Bob asked. I mean, you provided entertainment for Larry Atwell over here. Does he reciprocate and do something similar in return when you go there? That leads me to ask if any of the other company reps we do business with do the same. I don't want this to blow back on us. Only Larry. Trey said. Global has a condo for visiting dignitaries, so we pick up women over there and use that place. So you do this pick up women routine both here and there. One other concern is will your expense account pass muster if we look carefully? Bob asked. All of a sudden, Orville Fontenot Aka Trey Akalance got very nervous. Bob smiled and I saw him subtly push a button on his desk. Now we are going to take a very hard look at your expense account records, and if we find you have abused the system we will do one or both of the following. We will prosecute you for theft or embezzlement or whatever the legal beagles call it. But in any event we will take back the money from your final paycheck. Final paycheck. Trey croaked. You are firing me. Why? For taking sluts to a hotel. 
Yeah, you piece of shit. You see, one of those sluts you fucked this weekend, Donna, is my soon-to-be ex-wife. I sat from my side of the room. The other is my sister-in-law. I was gratified that he had no idea. He stared at me for a few brief moments before he muttered. Oh, fuck. A pair of security guards walked into the room as Trey glared at Bob and then me. You can't fire me for fucking your wife. He declared, recouping his position. It was consensual. It's not my problem she wanted to make a cuck out of you. I'll sue you both for wrongful termination. You should learn the law. Louisiana is an at-will state. We can fire you for any reason at any time short of something protected by law like discrimination. And screwing your boss's wife certainly does not fall into that category. Now these two gentlemen will escort you to your office to pack your personal effects. I'd advise you to leave before some of the employees learn what a low-life piece of shit you are. Trey switched tactics. Fire me and I'll tell everybody I screwed your wife and made you a cuck. He sneered. Everybody will know she and her sister are total sluts. Please, do. I entreated. It will save me the effort. You want to be known as a cuck? He asked incredulously as he paused. I don't want anybody to think I am treating my wife unfairly when I divorce her. I answered. As he was escorted away, he began to yell loudly he was being fired for screwing Jacob's wife. Would you say we knock off a little early, little brother? Bob said with a grin. I have a taste for a beer or three. We have another episode coming up in a couple hours to get ready for. I agreed. I was shaking with the adrenaline rush, but I let Bob guide my ass out the door. I knew his secretary and the security guys had been listening in on the whole conversation. Between that and Trey's loud declarations, by close of business, everybody in the company would be totally aware. I did not care in the slightest. You know Trey was yelling he screwed Jacob's wife. He didn't say which Jacob's. I laughed. Evelyn is gonna be pissed if people think it is her. Bob groaned. Now I really need the beer. He said. Trey better leave town, Evelyn might find him and castrate him. We laughed as we left. Bob and I were sitting in his living room sipping our beers at 5 o'clock when my phone rang. Showtime. I said. Sitting with us were my daughter June and the young cop Gary. They seemed to be enjoying each other's company and sat side by side on the sofa. I realized they were spending a fair amount of time together when Bob's wife Evelyn invited June to Sunday dinner, and she refused, saying she had a date with a man she just met. She'd been too busy to meet with me the evening before that as well. I was not at all surprised when he accompanied her this afternoon and to be honest, I fully approved. You sorry piece of shit. Donna's voice boomed over the speaker on my phone. Do you have any idea how humiliated I was? Do you realize that you might have cost me my promotion and maybe even my job? How could you do that? After all our years together. Well, I hope you don't lose your job. I answered, trying to keep a straight face. I'd hate to have to pay my unemployed ex-wife support. But I really do not care if your promotion is dead in the water. You might deserve it. To be honest, I timed you being served to the school board meeting being let out. And I could tell you were deeply humiliated. But as to why I would do it after our years together. Remember when you scoffed at me about how you're being a slut and cheating on me bruised my fragile male ego the other day. You even repeated the line when we talked yesterday. Well, I hope your fragile female ego took a beating. It certainly appeared so on the video I saw. Video. She screeched. Of course. My lawyer told me it was not a good idea for me to be present, so I sent somebody to record it. I said. Oh, speaking of video. I am going to send you a video of Orville Wendell Fontenot the third, or should I say turd giving details about you and Doris being his sluts for the whole weekend. Oh, I forgot. You don't know him by that name. But he told Bob and me how he impaled you on his lance many times this past weekend in all three of your holes. Donna's feeble lance. Was clearly audible. Yeah, it seems he works or rather used to work at Essink, and makes a hobby out of seducing married sluts at local pickup places. He was pretty graphic about how he and his buddy took both you and Doris in all three holes, and even invited his cousin up to the room to join them for a romp. Now I'd suggest you get an attorney quickly so you can sign and return the divorce papers. I'd hate to send copies of these videos to everybody. I'll like your parents. They're getting up there in age. I doubt they'd want to hear how both their daughters are three whole sluts. I like them, but there are limits as to how much I will spare them. I refuse to let them think of me as the bad guy in our divorce. You and Doris need to make sure of that. Yeah it is part of my fragile male ego, but I will not be the villain here. Now, I was very fair in the terms I offered. And even split with no alimony. Once you sell the house you can even keep bailing your sister out financially, well for a while at least. Until you run out of money. I'd advise you move in together and you control the money. I know she gave you bad advice and introduced you to Orville or Lance as he wants to be known, but you two might still work things out. 
Will, if you don't let your fragile egos get in the way. I heard her bawling as we disconnected. I looked around the room as I shrugged. In the video, it took a while for her to stop crying after she was served. I wonder how long it will take her now. I would never know. I had seen the video of her being served before Donna called. She had just come out of her meeting with the school board. They were there to discuss her promotion within the school administration system. On the video she walked out all smiles followed by several board members. I suspected it had very gone well on her behalf. That expression turned to a look of consternation when a young process server stepped up and asked her if she was Donna Jacobs. When she confirmed that, she was handed the envelope and heard the declaration she had been served. But because she had repeated that one dumbass phrase I could not get over her cheating and need for extra male companionship because of my fragile male ego, I went one step further. A male dressed as an old-time town crier hollered across the foyer and announced in a loud voice, Hear ye. Hear ye. Donna Jacobs, now known as the cheating slut has been served. Immediately two young women at his side began to toot on their gazoos. I thought at first they were just going to trumpet the announcement, but they began to play a tune that sounded like the song at a wedding, Here Comes the Bride. Then all three began to sing, Here Comes the Slut. All dressed to rut. Her marriage is over. She's out on her butt. They turned and walked out of the hall playing the tune on their gazoos. The video ended with Donna collapsing to her knees, bowling. Nobody noticed the young police officer standing to one side with a cell phone, recording the event. Daddy, Gary recorded that as a favor for you, but please don't send it out my daughter, June implored. I begged him not to record it, but he said he promised. He said his word is his bond. I told her the only person who might see that video from now on would be her mother unless she fought the divorce. And Donna would certainly get a copy of Fontenot's exit interview video. Epilogue. Donna did not fight the divorce. Her lawyer told her my terms were reasonable and in line with current divorce laws. As expected, she begged to go to counseling to save our marriage. I could tell by her look of anger when she opened her mouth about how I could not get over her actions and forgive her after 20 plus years of marriage, that she was about to mention my fragile male ego again. Say it. Say fragile male ego once. If I ever hear you or your sister utter that phrase, I will send all videos out. Especially to your parents. I said. She shut up and stared at me as she cried. She hated having to sell the house we used to own. It wasn't good enough for her until forced to sell. Then it was a palace. I really hope she didn't give too much of her share of the proceeds to pay her sister's bills. June said she would get involved and try to prevent that. I did not care. Orville, Akatre Akalans, found it difficult to get a job remotely similar to the plush job he had with us. Perhaps being charged with theft from abusing his expense account hurt his future chances. Perhaps it was the laughter the HR rep of any prospective company heard when they called to check his employment history. Only a few asked for a subsequent explanation. Trey's legal problems were compounded when the Marriott Hotel Corporation filed charges against him and his cousin for theft of services. I did not even know that was a thing, but a night manager is not authorized to comp rooms, especially for sexual benefits. The corporation made the situation public to set an example for their employees nationwide. I heard the charges were eventually dropped, but only after Orville and his cousin went bankrupt, trying to pay their $300 an hour attorney fees for their defense. Global Medical quickly fired and replaced Larry Atwell, Trey's friend. He joined Trey in the ranks of the unemployable. I'm guessing somebody is watching out for his future career like somebody here at home is watching Trey's. Of course, I lost out as well. My 24-year marriage was over. It would take me a while to regain trust in women, but I met several who assured me I could climb back in the saddle without much effort. They would help me. They were there to convince me I was wrong to judge women based on two in my family. On the bright side, I no longer had to contend with a cheating wife and a parasitic sister-in-law. The only two who came out ahead in this whole affair was my daughter June and future son-in-law Gary, former cop, and my present protege. And that's it for this two-part story. Trust is a fragile thing, and these stories remind us of the importance of nurturing it. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell, so you never miss a shocking revelation.